today I'm going to talk about the emergence of a new kind of leader, the, the anti-hero. I'm going to start off by asking you guys a few questions. Um, who here thinks that campaigners are going to be able to stop climate change? Anyone? One person optimist there, it's good to see. Who doesn't think they're going to be able to stop climate change? Far, far more people. I'm with you. I think it's impossible. Who thinks the bankers are really going to be able to configure the economy to drive new growth? Who thinks that's going to happen? Some people. Who doesn't think that's going to be able to happen? A lot more people. And I'm with you again. And who thinks politicians are really going to be able to bring peace to the Middle East? Anyone? No one really seems convinced about that one, and, and I'm with you as well. I think it's impossible for politicians on their own to do it. And I think it's time we all now have to face up to the fact that our historical way of leading just doesn't work anymore. And do we think this is a new kind of leader, Russell Brand? I'm a Billy, I think he's a good guy, but is this the future? People are laughing. I tend to agree. I think, I think he's great. I personally agree with almost all of what he says. But beyond the skinny jeans and the tattoos and the dubstep music track, I'm not sure it's very different from the campaigners we've seen for many, many years. I'm not sure it's very different. But there is a generation of leaders that are quite different to that, that are often operating undercover, often unseen in secret. This is a man called Antanas Mokus. In 1993, he was the director of the National Museum of Colombia in Bogota. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Bogota or the stories in those days, but it was crime-ridden. The highest homicide rate in the world, public services in collapse, um, protests on the streets. And that febrile atmosphere was moving onto the campus at the... Uh, Bogota National Columbia University. And Antanas thought, well, you know what? I'm going to have a um, meeting in a lecture theatre like this, but it was a lot bigger than this, with everyone to try and find out what the problem was, to talk to the students face to face, to see what their concerns might be. But the atmosphere was fraught. They thought a fight might take place. But anyway, he decided to take, take to the stage. And he tried to speak, but he couldn't. There were people shouting at him. People trying to run onto the stage. And in a moment of madness, he dropped his trousers. He turned around and, don't worry, I'm not going to do it. But he showed them his ass. A day later, he'd lost his job. He'd been in the organization for 20 years. This is Nikki Gamble. In 1994, she was the CEO of the Planned Pregnancy Organization in Boston, Massachusetts. I don't know how familiar any of you are with the abortion debate in the 90s in that part of America, but it was incredibly tense. It was violent. She had staff running various clinics, and they would get constant um, abuse from, through the mail, on the streets going to work. But she knew, she felt committed to this goal. She thought it was really important. And in particular, her clinics were in the prosperous part of town, where often you got less, um, where it was less controversial, but they were near... The, 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 um, the poorer parts of town where the need was often greatest as she saw it. And in 1994, a man called John Salvi walked into one of her um, clinics, shot the receptionist dead, injured someone else, went up the road to one of her other clinics, shot the receptionist there dead as well. It was kind of like the second tower being hit in 9-11. This was no accident. This was premeditated. This wasn't a mistake. Nikki was in shock. And so is the whole of Boston. What would you do when you're faced with this kind of challenge? Think about that. Would you focus on what you've done before, tried and tested relationships, tried and tested people, or would you do something different? Most people, 95% of leaders, tend to focus upon what they've done before. They're tried and tested ways of doing things. But there's a 5% who do something different, who can live in that zone of tension and wait for new possibilities to emerge. And that's what I'm going to talk about over the next 10 minutes. 
how can we, we can create those capabilities within ourselves. And it's people who are able to live in this zone of complexity, recognize that there is no black and white. We're living in a kaleidoscope grayscale. Who here is aware of the difference between complicated and complexity? People are familiar with that difference here? Some of you are, some of you aren't. So complicated is when things can be worked out, like an algebra equation. It might be difficult. You might need some help to do it if you're not good at maths, but you can work it out. Complex is when it's unpredictable, uncertain, when people don't know what the answers are and we have to learn upon the way. So staying fit. Who thinks that's um, complex? Who thinks it's complex to do that? A few of you. Who thinks it's complicated to do that? A few more of you think it's complicated. Well, I didn't know. Because <laughs> it kind of depends, I think, on your life. It's, it's a dependent upon so many conditions. I used to think it was really easy to stay fit. Then I had a couple of children. I have no time anymore. It seems to be really, really difficult to find the time that I used to be able to. So it's operating within the realities of our life. What about maintaining education standards with 20% less cash? Who thinks that's complex? Most people. Who thinks it's complicated? A few more. My feeling on that is it's highly complex, really difficult to be able to understand how to navigate and move into that zone. There's so many uncertainties that we need to address. Supporting local economic growth. Who thinks it's complex? Who thinks it's complicated? Nobody thinks it's complicated. I'm with you. Not quite, I think, as complex as the other one, but getting in that direction. What about being more energy efficient? Installing new photovoltaic light, lighting, insulation, all that kind of thing. Who thinks it's more complex? Who thinks it's complicated? I'm, I'm with you. I also think it tends to be more complicated. You can do it. We have the technology if we want to. Um, of course, there's a, there are behavior changes and we're operating within a social context. What about climate change? Who thinks that's complex? Almost everyone. Who thinks it's, oh, I've gone too quickly. But yeah, that, I mean, if there was anything that was obviously complex, it's climate change. If the Swedes could solve climate change, they'd have done it already. But it's not. It depends upon countries like ours, China, America, India, so many others also getting involved. It's highly uncertain, highly unpredictable, and highly complex. And Ronald Heifetz says that if you want to, so many of the problems we're tackling today will not be um, solved by technical solutions. They require flexibility and adaptive challenges. And that's really what we're trying to talk about. These anti-heroic leaders tend to be highly flexible and adaptive. So all of these challenges require that, both in our personal lives. And you can look at, for example, staying in love or bringing up children. These are all you know, complex, unpredictable elements. So we have to kind of think about how to, to do that. Um, Jim Collins he wrote the famous business classic, Good to Great, and he spoke about level five leaders. These guys were able to hold paradox, but he said that we don't know why they do that. We know that there are these people who are able to hold different kind of characteristics, but we don't know what makes them special. Well, actually, he was wrong. We do. There are people like David Rook, who spoke earlier today, who wrote this, this paper. Um, if you haven't read it, I strongly recommend you reading it. It, you can get it if you search online freely. Um, it's probably illegal to do that, but you can find it. Um, so it's, you didn't hear it here. Um, and these are the kinds of characteristics that they have, these, these paradoxical capabilities, being open-minded, not single-minded, um, feeling and thinking, seeing the big and the small picture, that, that ability to be able to both, when you meet someone who might hold a very different view from yourselves, be able to honor that, even if you totally disagree. And that's why I think very strongly that campaigning model of change that says, I am right and you are wrong, I just don't think that's useful anymore. I really feel that very strongly. And I used to be an environmental campaigner working in Parliament. That was my job. Um, this is um, a diagram from a guy, uh, a Harvard academic called Robert Keegan. Um, and he talks about people being at the self-transforming mind stage of their development, whereby they can sit in that, that zone of tension and, and wait for new things to emerge, that feeling that need to go for it, having a focus, having a goal. It's about having intentionality, but being very, very open-minded about what could come, what could happen next. Has anyone here read the book, The Filter Bubble? Anyone heard of that bu book? It's all about how, in today's world, with the internet, we are getting more, we're actually getting more and more 
affected by people's views who are like ourselves. We're getting more and more reinforced of our own views. And if you look at the information you get on your Twitter feed or from Google, the personalization is also a kind of narrow casting. It means you're, you, know, you tend not to be friends with people who have different political views from you. Some of you might be, and it's built on the talks you were saying earlier about how it's vital to be open to those different perspectives. But when we're in that world of the filter bubble, it can often become harder and harder to stretch that muscle of being exposed and empathising with people that are different from us. And it's this idea that we're being hit constantly by enormous quantities of information, but of course we have to focus. Now, this is my car. It's a Nissan Almera. I don't know if anyone else here has a Nissan Almera. Um, I have one. It was cheap. It, I bought it from the guy down the road. It's only broken down twice. I have only had it a couple of years. <laughs> Once in a field in France on a Sunday. That was a great part of our holiday. Um, but before I bought this Nissan Almera, I, I, I lived in London. I was a cyclist. Cars were something that were in between me and my destination. I didn't really know the difference between Ford and Mercedes. I knew the brands. I watched the Grand Prix. But more than that, it didn't make any sense. And I bought this Nissan Almera. And I've become aware that everyone seems to own a silver Japanese car, Toyota, Nissan, they're everywhere. And the point is, is once you're holding that hammer, you start seeing it. And I went to the States and I had no idea. Nissans, Toyotas, you know, the most popular cars, I think, in America at the moment. Um, and so there's that point that when, you, when we're thinking in certain kinds of way, we see certain kinds of things. And what I think is interesting is about how... We move out of being automatic, about of being habitual. Are we able to take a step back in perspective around how we live, how we live? So as opposed to just thinking that everyone doesn't have a car, create the space to create that perspective. And I think as soon as we're operating in an automatic way, which we all do, that's the kind of indication that we need to perhaps do things differently. We need to have the capability to be able to choose which gear we're going to be in. We may want to relax. We may want to be open-minded. I'm going to do a very, very quick exercise with everyone here. I'm about everyone to stand up. I know you're eating your dinner, but if you are... OK. I want everyone to focus on the, um, the gear stick in front of them. Look at the gear stick. And then, as I'm speaking, start to just feel your body. Just bring your attention inside and feel how you're feeling. And slowly bring the attention of other things into your consciousness. The attention of maybe your jaw eating, the smell of the person sitting next to you, or stand, now standing next to you, the feeling of your clothes on your shoulders, on your legs. And then gradually now I want you to expand that to maybe the feeling of the floor under your feet, the person standing a couple of meters away from you. And then start bringing in the lighting from the ceiling and the, the blue uh, drapes at the side of the room. And bring more and more and more of that into your attention. But keep focused on the gear stick. Never stop looking at the gear stick. And bring more and more information into your attention all of the time. This is expanded awareness. And when you're in expanded awareness, you often tend to feel much more relaxed and at least much more aware of the things that are going on out there, as opposed to into that single-minded focusness that we get, say, when we're looking at our iPhone. Can anyone tell me how they're feeling right now? Anyone want to share? Relaxed. That is the normal response. Some people don't always feel that way, I know. Thank you. You can sit down and finish your lunch. Thank you for that. But it's that idea of being in expanded awareness that we're trying to support and create here. And one of the things that we know is to create these new kind of anti-heroic leaders, is it's about transformative learning and not informative learning. We've got all the information we need on our phones, on our computers. Our brains are never going to be able to compete with the awesome power of the internet. I'm not saying don't learn new stuff. I love reading as much as anyone else. But what I am saying is to be able to become these kind of new anti-heroic leaders that we need. It's about putting yourself into perspective situations where you can see the world from a different perspective. And as we do more of this stuff, certainly my experience, and I'm just at the start of my own journey, is you start seeing your whole life from an ever more detached perspective. So I started off being an environmental campaigner thinking that if you didn't believe um, the same as me, then you were somehow wrong. Now, you know, I start thinking about my speech 
I don't know if any of you guys think this, but you know, why is it that I say what I say? Is it because I want to be liked by you? Is it because I want you to do something on my behalf? Is it because my parents told me if I don't say thank you and please or that I will somehow be a bad person? But I think having that ongoing inquiry into why we do what we do it seems to be like an, one of the key muscles which seem to underpin why it is these anti-heroes have got that level of perspective and are able to detach themselves from their habitual actions. Many of our habits, like breathing, like you know, making pleasant conversation, are incredibly valuable. They really serve us. So it's not about saying they're right or wrong. It's about making the decision, are they working, are they not? And it's about, as other people have said, putting ourselves outside our comfort zone, going on that long-haul trip, staying in a dodgy hotel, going to do... Going to do a, I'm doing a stand-up comedy course tonight. I've always wanted to do one of those. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's, gonna be, that's about me trying to do something that uh, I have never done before. Um, it might be that you want to do kickboxing, as David Rook said earlier. Um, so I'd like to take you back to Bogota in 1993. Atanas Mokos was walking along the streets. Um, he'd lost his job. And he didn't really know what to do. But he'd gained a certain kind of notoriety. Um, people started listening to his opinions in a way they never had before. Um, and he started appearing on television. And he wrote art blogs, or I suppose articles as they would have been in those days. And people read them. And then someone said, well, why don't you stand to become the mayor of Bogota? And he'd never really thought about that before. And he said, well, I've not got a job. Why don't I do it? I've got nothing to lose. And six months later, he was the mayor of Bogota. Um, and under his leadership, Mogadishu was transformed. No longer did it have the highest homicide rate in the world. He introduced things. He did things like having. He took a shower on television naked to demonstrate water efficiency. He sacked all of the inefficient um, traffic police, so the corrupt traffic police, and replaced them with mime artists. But it wasn't all about being crazy. It was about, you know doing things in different, and being, working with different groups and being aware that his way of doing things before wouldn't always function. And you may be aware that Bogota has become a much more prosperous, less crime-ridden place than it was before. And Nicky Gumbel, on that fateful day in Boston when two of her colleagues had been killed, she went back, regrouped with her team, obviously was focused mainly on trying to ensure that they were supported in such a challenging moment. And then she did something which no one had ever done before in the abortion movement in that part of the state. She spoke to the guys who were the anti-abortionists, not to try and change their mind, just to try and understand them. And, then, and they ended up meeting together for a number of years through something called the Boston's Conversations Project, whereby they just sought to understand one another. Why, do you, why are you so against abortion? Why are we so in favor of it? And what was amazing about these examples is that at the end of a six-year process, they felt even more strongly that they were right. But the atmosphere in Boston had completely changed from having a media debate that was completely antagonistic and oppositional. They'd become supportive. They became mutually appreciative of what was taking place. And... The, they, they put in place a policy around supporting planned pregnancies, which worked for everyone, and the issues around abortion being such a big issue reduced. No one again was killed in the name of abortions in, in that part of the States. But despite these ideas, you know, there are many politicians and leaders who are still behaving in a clearly a very heroic way. George Osborne behind me, you know, in my view, the most powerful politician Britain's seen for an awful long time. I think that he had a very big role in getting the, um, the uh, no vote out for the Scottish um, elections. But I'm not sure we can expect these guys in these locations to be any different. They're inside a system where the spotlight of the media is so strong that can we expect them to be nuanced, talking in, you know, more uh, empathetic language, being more sensitive. The, the media, as any of you will know, is brutal when you behave in that kind of way. So I'm not sure we can expect the change to come from our current leaders. I think it has to come from us. We, don't have, you know, we ourselves are not under the kind of spotlight of those kind of people. We cannot expect our leadership of what the new leaders are going to be like to come from the old system. So I think it's up to us, up to us to look at how can we 
you know, change how we live our lives? How can we unhook ourselves from our unhelpful habits? How can we deeply explore you know, the operating principles that function in our lives? This is based on a short book I wrote called Antihero. If you're interested in it, download it for free. Um, I hope that was interesting. And um, now we'll move on to the open space sessions. Thank you very much.